I'm going to go ahead and record. Okay, well, again, I'm Roger Royce, uh, tax and corporate partner with Haynes Boone in Palo Alto. This is the Silicon Valley M&A Affinity Group, and I'd like to introduce our speaker today, which is Jeff Hook. He's a senior finance director at John Hopkins Carey School of Business and managing director of Hook Associates, a finance consulting firm. Uh, he has been a uh, director at, at Focus Bank as well, and a director of emerging markets um, of the World Bank Group. He's the author of five books, and the one that I think we'll probably hear most about today is The Myth of Private Equity, an inside look at Wall Street's transformative investments, um, together with several other books on, on business topics. He's co-authored several peer-reviewed academic papers in finance and has written many position papers for nonprofit think tanks. Is an MBA from Wharton and BS from the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Jeff, for being with us here today. And I'm going to turn the presentation over to you. Jeff, I think you're on mute. Okay, I think we're all set. Yep. So Thanks for the intro. Thanks for the invite. I know I'm in good company. I've closed probably 50 or 60 M&A deals in my career. So I'm, I could sit and talk with a few of you all day, but that's not the subject we're covering today. We're gonna to cover the myth of private equity. So before I start, I just want you to pretend that you've got two pills. And your left hand is a blue pill. And on your right, in your right hand is a red pill. So if you take the blue pill, you are gonna believe all the hype about private equity and you'll remain in blissful ignorance. If you take the pill, the red pill in your right hand, which I hope you do over the next 40 minutes or so, you'll look through some of the hype and you'll see what the business is truly like. So with that, I wanna kind of, look at the principal investors in private equity, okay? So state pension funds, university endowments, sovereign wealth funds, these are the principal investors in private equity. And what are their objectives? This is kind of big picture stuff. Well, they wanna preserve the capital they've got. They want some current income. Optimally, they'd like a little increase in the value of their investments and some liquidity. They do not generally want a big risk profile. And going back 25, 30 years, how did they achieve these objectives? They were generally buying publicly traded bonds, blue chip stocks. And then 80s, early 90s, Wall Street started introducing some new instruments like junk bonds, private equity, real estate, stuff that wasn't in the norm, so-called con weren't conventional investments. So what was the sales pitch that these were higher return, lower risk type investments? And just to sum it up, despite buying trillions of dollars, these investments, 95% of those institutions have been unable to beat a 60-40 passive index, 60 bonds, 40 stocks. I'm sorry, 60, 60 stocks, 40 bucks. I thought that was a fascinating statistic. So here's what I'm covering. What is private equity? You know, what's the myth I keep talking about? The performance, problem with some of the performance measurements. Why do people still invest? So I know we're talking to some people that are Silicon Valley residents. You know, venture capital is what you typically associate with. Silicon Valley, that's about 20% of the PE universe. LBOs are about two thirds. Uh, and the book is really about LBOs, <clears throat> uh, which is kind of where I had most of my experience in as an investment banker. And what is an LBO? I mean, you're, this group, I'm not sure I have to explain it, but you know, it's a, an LBO fund is a big pool of money. It's a blind pool. Institutional investors put up the money. People running the fund are people like ourselves, usually investment banker types that know how to close deals, don't really know much about running a company. And the whole thesis is you're buying low-tech firms that are profitable, and therefore you can borrow most of the money to buy the company in the first place. 
And the whole theory behind LBOs is if you have slightly higher debt in a capital structure of a company, if thing, assuming things turn out well, the equity return is higher with more debt than it is with lower debt, whereas the opposite holds if things don't go so well. Now the LBO fund cycle, just like a venture capital fund is supposed to be 10 years. It's a no cut contract, which means the investors in the fund have a very difficult time, if not possible time firing, firing the managers. So the idea behind the 10 year life is you've got a few years, years to find and close the deals. Then you have a couple, three years to try to improve the companies you bought. And then you need a couple of years to exit. So I like liken the private equity fund to sort of a concentrated stock fund where you're buying 10 or 15 stocks. In this case, of course, you're buying you know, control. So you have more input in the management of the company. Now the fairy tale you keep hearing in the buyout business is, well, we, we buy companies that are hurting and we fix them up and therefore we're doing a good thing for society. And if you believe that, I got a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. You know, most of the buyout deals are going to be healthy companies that have a history of making money. Otherwise, you couldn't raise the debt leverage. You know, banks don't like loaning money to companies that are fixer uppers. In fact, about a third of PE buyout deals are one PE fund buying a company from another one. So I don't know what there's left to improve. The, the first PE fund should have already done that. So anyway, let's go over the basic sales pitch and the myth. It starts with the claim that PE has not only higher returns, but it's safer than say the stock market. That's a ludicrous theory to begin with. First, the companies have much more debt. So how can they be safer than a company with less debt? You know, about 20 or 25% of all LBOs go bankrupt. And <clears throat> The theory that Nobel laureates in finance and other people have proven over the decades is that, you know, if, if a company, if a private equity fund were to be less risky and higher returns, you know, it gradually competition would push it to this security market line. So let's look at the performance for a second. There's three basic measurements. There's the IRR, I'm sure you all know about that, public market equivalent, which is where you take the money that the fund's putting out and you pretend that there's a S&P index that you're putting in the same amount of money at the same amount of time. And that way you can compare it easily. And then there's the total value in the total value out measurement. So the IRR, let's look at the S&P 500 versus say the buyouts. So this is not adjusting for illiquidity or shaky a mark to market. So, you know, 10 years, you know, I've used, I don't want to cherry pick. So I use three or four start years, three or four end years. And you can see that public stocks are slightly ahead of the LBO business the last 10 years, last 15, it's, it's you know, slight, slight premium to the LBO business. But this is if you believe all the mark to markets of the PE business and you ignore what's kind of manipulation we'll talk about in a few minutes. VC, which I'm sure many of you run into, basically has the same return problems. It doesn't beat the S&P 500 over various measurements periods. So let's look at this one. So the IRR, you know, it's it's not really very much in favor of private equity. Let's look at this one, the public market equivalent. And here, if you have a score under this measurement that's larger than one, the fund has beaten the public market. So here you can see the last 15 years that are measurable, you know, the funds that are too new, you really can't measure you know, the numbers are like one or 1.1 1 .1, and they're really not hitting the cover off the ball. It's pretty mediocre to say the least. Let's look at the last one, total value in the total out. So that is like here you have a billion dollars you've invested in a fund as a bunch of LPs. You paid out 
funds paid out 500 million through selling companies or dividends and they and then they claim that what's left is worth 800 million so the tvpi measurement would be 1.3 for this particular fund if you look at buyout deals over the last 15 16 years the average is about 1.5 and if you say you can't be you can't be right you can just look up calpers results which are published a lot of states do not publish their pension fund results but calpers does publish their pe and over the last 25 or 30 years it's been 1.5 for their pe funds so i don't think that's particularly terrific 1.5 i mean that's not pretty mediocre if you kind of look at the average life of these uh, funds, you, you got like an 8% return. It's not very, uh, it doesn't, that's not mind boggling to me or world beating. And why don't they do better? Why don't they do better? Well, the fees are so darn high. Yeah. The annual PE fees are about three and a half percent, which I find incredible, but people are paying them. These pension <laughs> funds, endowments are paying them. It's three and a half percent off the top, which is like a 2% fixed fee and then some kind of carried interest. And if you look at the New Jersey State Employees Fund, where I was a consultant for a few months, so they were the unions were a little worried about all the fees they were paying. Here you had a $9 billion PE fund portfolio. And over a five-year period, they paid $1.2 billion in fees. That's about 15% of the money. How are you going to beat the stock market if you're paying 15% of your money in fees? So what are some problems with the measurements? Well, there's really no premium for illiquidity. So if you were to require some kind of premium, you know, the experts say, oh, it ought to be about 3%. And, you know, I'm sure some of you, when you do private, you know, valuations for stock options or something, you have a haircut for illiquidity in private companies. If you're doing force, let's say an S&P, plus 3% premium, 90% of the P managers be out of business tomorrow. They're not doing it. Now let's look at mark the market. So we all know what that is. If you've got a PE fund and you've got five companies you haven't sold yet, the PE managers mark to market these companies. And they're sort of grading their own homework much to uh, the surprise of many. And they sort of smooth the results to make it look like they're less risky than the stock market. So when the stock market, you know, the last big stock market dropped with 2009, the S&P dropped 37%. If you've got more leverage, your equity value should actually drop more than 37%. The PE business said, no, we only dropped 30%. Of course, that refutes any kind of logic. Don't worry, nobody's enforcing the rules. Anyway, here's a chart just shows you this kind of smoothing pattern of these funds. And for those of you that really like crunching numbers, which I assume there'd be a few of you out there, you know, you can look at enterprise values and you know what would be the effect on equity returns with higher leverage and so on. So there's a lot of dependence on unsold deal values in these numbers. So if you go back to 2011, so you got a 10 year old PE fund. If it says it's TVPI was 1.5, if you go look at the vintage year statistics, like 30% of that hasn't been sold yet. This is 10 years, I'm telling you, 10 years, and they haven't sold a third of the stuff. When are they gonna sell this stuff? If it's so valuable, how come they haven't been able to sell it? So, you know, that's one reason you're starting to hear about GP, you know, GP led funds and continuation funds because they can't sell the stuff. The statistics are quite remarkable. You got to write a book before you even see some of these numbers. So, you know, it's just surprising how much hasn't been sold yet. Now, manipulation comes up from time to time in this business. So how do you inflate your IRR if you're running a PE fund? Well, you sell your good deals first. And the way the IRR math works, you know, if you have cash up front, that helps a lot. 
<clears throat> you can also do it with credit lines. You probably couldn't do this in the venture capital business, but the, you know, the LBO business is a little easier. So how does that work? Well, the fund manager, there's some of them are so big, they can just borrow money on their own. So they borrow money on their own, buy a company, and then drop it into a fund six months later. So what that does mathematically is it decreases or compresses the amount of time that the company is owned by the fund. And if you do all the math, that kicks up your IRR between one and 3%, assuming you know, the company works out okay. Uh, you know, the Enron team would blush at these kinds of actions, but they're quite common. Here's a little diagram of how it works. Now, I kind of alluded to the TVPI already. So if the actual TVPI is one, one and a half and the industry runs around saying their returns are 20% plus, that doesn't make any logical sense. You know, then the TVPI should be three or something if you're getting a 20% compounded return. So, you know, there's something strange going on that no one seems to want to point out. So I'll just give you an example. We've all heard of Apollo Group. They claim that their IRR is 24%. Their average TVPI is only 1.6. I mean, that's only two and a half years of returns, really. The other thing that's kind of interesting is the number of funds that are missing from the database. It's the statistics I've just shown you. <clears throat> You know, these come from the databases like Prequin or PitchBook. They only capture about 60% of the fund. So we're missing 40%. In fact, I just read of someone before I, you know, I looked yesterday when I was thinking about this talk, I looked at venture capital and, you know, they're missing 40% of the funds as well, these, these databases. So, you know, if the 40% are doing so well, how come they don't report to the databases? You'd think they'd want to get more publicity for their successful performance, but they don't do it. So I'm a little suspicious perhaps. The other thing and you may have heard about is the premium returns, which is the returns over the stock market are concentrated in the top quartile. You know, that's sort of a refrain you keep hearing. Oh, they're, we're all gonna buy in a top quartile fund if we're an LP. That means 75% aren't doing so hot. I mean, what kind of industry 75% of the people don't perform and still stays in business? So <clears throat> what you see in the LBO industry is that up to three quarters of the funds say they are in the top quartile. Uh, now, I'm not a math major. I never was in college, but I don't think three quarters fits into the top quartile. So there's something odd going on there. So in the book, I compare it to Garrison Keillor's fictional Lake Wobegon, where at Lake Wobegon, of course, every child was considered above average. So you've got the same real life parallel here in the PE business. The other interesting factoid is they, PE funds, at least in the LBO side, cannot repeat their performance. So if you have a, let's say you got fund three that was a top quartile fund. Fund four, what are the chances of fund four being in the top quartile? It's totally random. Even the big funds like KKR, Apollo, Goldman Sachs, have the same problem. They cannot duplicate the prior fund success, assuming you know, it was successful. So <clears throat> that's a little different than say the VC business where there is some evidence of persistence. It's not terrific, but there is more than the LBO business. But how, if you can't pick on history, how do you pick an LBO fund? If you're a big LP like CalPERS, you try to buy a brand name. Goldman Sachs, Carlisle, KKR, got a little problem with that strategy. If you look at the data, there's no difference in the performance of a Goldman Sachs versus some no-name fund. 
So rather than buying the brand name, you could just buy the store brand. Despite these two facts, institutions still try to have their consultants look at history or brand name, just defying all the science. So, you know, say, okay, Jeff, you pissed all over the institutional PE business. Why do the big LPs like CalPERS and Harvard and Yale, why do they still buy these funds? Well, you got to look past the board of directors. You have to look at the managers. The board of directors usually don't know what they're doing in terms of investments. They're not sophisticated people like yourself. You know, they might be a college president or some big contributor to the college, or in the case of a pension fund, a political appointee. A lot of them are union leaders. So they're delegating the investment function to professional managers. Again, many of the resumes be similar to yours, I guess. And these professional managers have figured out, well, if I index the whole fund to 60-40, 60, 60 stocks, 40 bonds, public, CalPERS will make more money that way. But then how am I going to get paid a million dollars a year if I index? The board of directors is going to say, what do we need you for? A computer can index. So there's a whole fiduciary contradiction where the managers themselves are lowering the returns to their own employers to boost their compensation. Now, the other one, which I think is you know, a little less prevalent, but maybe you know, might be some instances would be what I call the Stockholm syndrome, which is patterned after a number of bank customers were kidnapped in Stockholm like 15 years ago. And they were held for a couple of days by the bank robbers before everybody surrendered. And the victims started to, had started to empathize with their kidnappers, and refused to testify against them in court. And if you talk to these managers at these big state pension funds or endowments, they like to hang around Wall Street types. They go to these conferences in Bermuda or Big Sur or whatever. And, you know, they just don't, they don't look at the science. They're kind of just listening to the propaganda. Now, <clears throat> you might say, well, big PE fund managers like Henry Kravis or David Rubenstein, it must be lonely at the top, sitting up there with all your billions at the top of the PE pyramid. But even though they're sitting up there with all that money, they still need help from their friends. And they've got plenty of friends or enablers. You know, the principal enabler would be the SEC. They're supposed to be regulating and protecting investors, even these sophisticated investors that supposedly know what they're doing. But they basically are off the beat. The sheriff is not in town. And these performance claims, which I pointed out, the fees go entirely unchecked. And uh, the enabling just drifted down to state legislatures. Many states uh, prohibit the disclosure of private equity fees paid by the pension funds or the returns of specific private equity. They actually pass laws, you know, like this stuff is secret, like nuclear codes or something. If federal, you know, government, of course, allows them to have huge debt deductions and their bankruptcy laws are quite lenient. And then lastly, you might say, well, why hasn't the business media investigated this? Well, for years, they've been sort of an echo chamber. And you, if you read the Wall Street Journal or Financial Times, you know, generally, they're just beating the drum for private equity. They don't really get into some of the things we've talked about. They're starting to get a little more circumspect about private equity than very slow. Uh, part of it's what's, uh, you know, it's sort of, I'm protecting my PE sources if I'm on the PE beat as a reporter. And if I write an article that says how lousy PE is, well, then my sources are going to dry up. So just to close, I like to say the private equity managers are living the dream. Let's look at what they've got going. Mediocre performance at best, 10-year fixed fee contracts, 
they only have to put up 3% of the money. That's just two years of fees. So they have no risk at all of their own money. And all the regulators, media, any kind of guardrails are totally absent. I don't think it gets any better than this. So that's what I'd like to cover with you and I'd be happy to take some questions.